You know that one song you can't get enough of? Chances are it was made with a sample from Splice. Explore top packs made by your favorite producers, sketch out song ideas in seconds with Create Mode, and dive into a sample catalog that's so deep, it's dangerous. Find out why Splice is the industry's not-so-secret secret. Visit splice.com and try for free today. Welcome to The Fader Interview. I'm Alex Robert Ross, Editorial Director of The Fader. When Laura Les of 100 Gex spoke to The Fader for a Gen F feature in the fall of 2019, she said that she and her bandmate, Dylan Brady, thought their debut album would be good, but that it would be slept on. And that would have been a sensible bet. Brady and Les, friends for years after growing up in the same orbit in St. Louis, had been making fascinating music apart for years, both under their own names and under various pseudonyms. Their self-titled debut EP as 100 Gex was an overwhelming combination of abrasive noise and sugar-high melodies that, even in hindsight, nobody could have expected to break through. But 1000 Gex, their debut album, released three years later, was something different. Produced over the internet, with Brady in LA and Les back in Missouri, it was truly anarchic. A combination of pop, noise, trance, punk, ska, and metal. Its creators seemed to be permanently glitching too, with Les's voice pitched up into uncanny territory, and no one sound hanging around for more than a couple of seconds before jolting into something else. And it wasn't slept on at all. An aesthetic that had been building for at least as long as PC music had been around suddenly had a name, Hyperpop, and a totally unsuspecting duo as its figurehead. Cue a million think pieces about how 100 Gex were truly the sound of our weird, memeified present. Hyperpop exploded, and then the world locked down and Hyperpop exploded some more. Kids all over the world with access to every song in human history and a bunch of shit to figure out were suddenly locked in their bedrooms with GarageBand for company. Brady and Les went out on tour, played some shows inside the video game Minecraft, and got to work on their second album, inevitably called 10,000 Gex. They even announced the album in the fall of 2021 and released a single, Me Me Me, to celebrate. Magazines wrote cover stories about their return, but there was never any release date. The single came and went. The band weren't happy with what they'd recorded and they wanted to start over. So, 18 months on from the band confirming its existence, 10,000 Gex is out this Friday. And 100 Gex still sound unmistakably like themselves, jumping from third wave ska to brutal metal breakdowns, to Blink-182 style pop-punk, to something resembling Limp Bizkit, in the space of a few breaths. They're still irreverent and fun. There's a song called Frog on the Floor about a frog who's on the floor, and occasionally does keg stands. And at the same time, there's still more melancholy behind Les's lyrics than most critics will acknowledge. But this isn't by any means a retread. A Thousand Gex sounded like the place it was made, the internet. And its follow-up sounds like LA, where Les moved so that she could work in person with Brady this time. Les's voice is still heavily auto-tuned, but it's not pitched up anymore. She doesn't sound like a human trapped in a computer here. Even when they're paying eerily faithful tribute to unloved sounds from the turn of the millennium, a hundred gecks sound present, and still thrillingly of the future. Earlier this week, I caught up with Les and Brady to talk about recording in the same room as System of a Down, making music that's fun without being treated as frivolous, and the influence they want to have on younger musicians coming through. I remember 10,000 Gex being announced 18 months ago. I've got emails about it from like late summer 21. So what happened? We had to finish it and then it took forever to fucking get it from finished to out, annoyingly. But the finishing process, there was a little bit of scrapping and starting again, right? Yeah, I mean, like with everything, like we always are scrapping shit and being like, nah, this this could be better. I literally just changed something recently. Wait, what did you change? Can't tell you. No, well, actually, I guess I guess everyone will know, right? Yeah, because the fucking it's pretty apparent. Yeah. Um, there's like two different verses in the streaming version as opposed to the the record version. I was like, these verses, I w- I want them to be different, so I changed them. Oh, so we're coming right down to the deadline. For streaming. 
Down to the wire. The record and the CDs will have the old one. And I guess the version that I've heard will be different to the streaming version as well, because I've had this for a few months now. Yeah, the press version. They're all they're the one we send to press is different than the vinyl too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. It's like <laughs> it's like there's like a hundred different versions because we fucking weren't we just kept wanting to change shit. The fader version, the pitchfork version, the Rolex Stone version. All the video versions don't have the final master. It's just like it's a whole fucking mess. <laughs> kind of the, the Kanye West approach to streaming, but completely accidental. I actually hate that approach. Well, they're adapting things after they've been released. Yeah, I really, really hate that. Once it's out, I'm never going to touch it again. But, but up until Friday, it's fair game. I feel like it's like your obligation. But once, it, once, it, once it's out, I do fucking hate the idea of going back and changing it later. So you wouldn't touch me, me, me. Why would I touch me, me, me? Me, me, me is perfect. I'm just, oh no, I'm not suggesting <laughs> I'm just saying as an example of something you have put out, but that's technically on the album and therefore like it's a oh. fishy middle ground. Okay. Well, maybe. I think my distinction is the album as a as a whole piece, I wouldn't touch after it was on streaming. I don't know though. I feel like even that rule could be could be bent given like whatever <laughs> circumstance. You back down from this so quickly, but I respect it. I, I get it. I don't know. I don't have much conviction for any of my beliefs. I, I, you know, when they talk about like, stand for nothing, you'll fall for everything. They're talking about me. I stand for. I stand for nothing. I'll fall for anything. Like a joke when I'm talking to you I take it back quick and I'm not like true Cause you say so many things and I don't know what I mean Short messages to you, short messages to me Now if I think of a joke when I say goodbye I put my paws on my face and pretend to cry But I left you fucking hard You probably think I'm so mean but I don't even know you I've heard like various numbers about how many demos that you'd made they're all true. What's the going one? 4,000? I think the highest one was something around 600. 600? <laughs> We've gotten questions where people are like, did you really do 4,000 demos for this album? Yeah, we did. I mean, Carly Rae Jepsen does like 300 for each album. Rookie numbers. 3,700 too few. We're knocking about three, uh, three demos a day, every day. <laughs> I think what I'm trying to get at is like, did you have like the skeleton of what you thought was 10,000 Gex, and then you pulled a bunch of stuff back from it. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, the, the story is true. It's just... The details. We, it's a more interesting number. But yeah, the, the story is... We had like 10 songs that we were like, yeah, this is going to be the album. And then we were like, let's do something else instead. Because we were both like, this isn't hitting as hard as it could be. What survived? Hollywood Baby survived and Doritos, I think, was in the original batch. Sounded different, but it survived. I remember. And Run Runaway, which is the on the Snake Eyes EP, was like one of the early songs. And because so, Runaway is a mixture of two different songs, and both of those both of those were in the original batch. And I don't remember what else. Tor maybe Torture Me? Well, no, kind of. Like, kind of Torture Me, but not really. I know that it's kind of a cliche, but like there was very little pressure on 1000 gags. You're pretty free to make that. And suddenly a lot of eyes from everyone, from a fan base and also from, you know, people like us and a major label involved. Did you feel that? And did that have some sort of bearing on that decision to scrap a lot of stuff and start from scratch? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. Had a lot of bearing on a lot of things, for sure. It's a totally different like vibe when you're embracing the machinery of it all. Did that amount of pressure, does it make music making less fun? I mean, personally, yeah, totally. 100%. Well, but but like it really, you you can definitely affect it with how you think about things. Like I was like way in it and shit. And I was like caring too much about granular shit that is not like whatever. Like I was like getting too too in that headspace and shit. I thought it was dope because I got huge speakers because of it. 
Well, yeah, but I mean, that's the nuance of it is like, yeah, it was, it was sick. Cause like, yeah, of course, like I don't have to fucking, there's, there, it just, it's just a different way of being, I guess. When like, you're like, oh, cool. Like you change, change your whole life. But then like, at the same time, there's like this, uh, I don't know, pressure or whatever. I, it was fucking with my head basically. Is what I'm saying. There was no label person with a gun to my head or something. It's like it just was. I in my in my own head, it was not uh, not super chill. I didn't uh, like the pressure. A huge part of, of what makes Gex Gex is that it sounds fun, and that you've you've spoken openly about it before. Like you want it to be a fun experience. Like you care about how the listener responds to this. So how do you get out of that headspace? Like how do you make fun music when the circumstances aren't like naturally set up to, to be given over to that? I don't know. Dylan sent a bunch of demos that were really fun and cool. And I was like yelling when I heard them. And I was like, this is super fun. <laughs> and when, you know, when when you're actually in it and you're you're working on it, you know, a lot of times it's it's very fun when you are able to tune tune stuff out. Like the func the functionally making music is still super fun. It's like never not gonna be like that. You know, like it's super, it's super duper fun to make a song, but best thing in the world, especially with my best friend, Dylan Brady. <laughs> <laughs> Does it become harder to keep it sort of fun and breezy when it's been gestating for so long? Like when you've had sort of two years of working on some of the songs and, and pouring over it, like, I mean, your relationship with these songs is going to be so different to your audience's relationship to them. Like that, that these, in some cases, these are like 18 month old songs. So like, do you, is that, is it tough to like get that excitement for them in the same way? Uh, no. Yeah. I'm really stoked for it to come out. Yeah. We're super, we're super stoked for it to come out. The, the waiting was like the, the part that was like kind of more like, uh, you know, I mean people, you know, it's like two years since your last thing or whatever, but like there was like a whole pandemic and like a bunch of like things happening and uh i moved and like our entire lives have changed and we did like three tours and we did like maybe like two hours worth of music online that we did for like uh online sets so it's like yeah it was a while for sure but like at the same time it's not like one it's not like we were fucking off and two it's not like we we were spending every moment focusing on the album and whatever like we had hella different i mean if you think of what happens in your life in two years a lot of different shit goes on so yeah so i think the the real like crunch of like trying to like get these songs made was like a few months and that was between that we had a tour in between that too we, we took like three months got in the studio and we're like working on the the songs. And then we had a tour, which was a couple months, I think. We spent like another month, I think, or like a couple weeks. And then that kind of put us in the end game type phase. You know, it's it's funny to hear people be like, God damn, it's been two years. But it's like, we've been busy. We've been doing we've been doing shit. No, no. I mean, let's talk about some of that. Cause okay, so Laura, you you moved to LA. Dylan, you were already there. A thousand gex reflects where it was made, because it sounds like it was made on the internet. And I think this album actually does sound quite LA. I don't think I'm re like reading too much into it. I mean, it, like obvious references, like- The song is called Hollywood, Hollywood Baby. Hollywood Baby thing is like an obvious reference and like the Anthony Cletus reference on Most Wanted Person and stuff. I don't know, do you think the sound runs deeper than that? Because I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm like overanalyzing it, but I, can, I, I feel more LA in this record. I think you're not overanalyzing it, but I don't know if we could speak on all of that. <laughs> What does LA sound like to you? Having moved there recently, what does it sound like to you? I don't know. I guess LA sounds like uh, sounds like Ten Thousand Gex. Sounds like the last two albums that System of Down put out. Sounds like uh, any uh, last album by a band uh, that's <laughs> about LA. <laughs> I I mean, yeah. It's I moved again. Also. <laughs> I don't live in LA anymore. Moved in and out. 
But I mean, it's not bad. I'm not saying I'm not trying to shit talk LA. It's just like it's a it's a vibe. Love LA. A lot of great places to go eat. A lot of uh, beautiful palm trees. I love looking out on the the skyline when you're driving in LA and you just see like rows and rows and rows and rows of palm trees. It's pretty cool. My my best friend Dylan Brady is there, so that's a great part about it. I was all wondering if there was something about Los Angeles that particularly appealed to both of you. I'm from London and I'm in Toronto right now, so I couldn't be further physically or spiritually from Los Angeles right now. But I think from the outside, LA is perceived as a bit kitschy and it's like perceived as something that like a lot of people don't quite understand it. And there's an assumption of irony and superficiality there, but it's actually this sort of sprawling and rich place that's quite misunderstood by other people. And I wonder if there's something about 100 Gex that maybe... I think there's something true about both of what you just said, both sides of what you just said. Well, Dylan, Dylan, what did you think about LA when you moved there? He moved there like years before I did. I thought about dropping out of school and moving with him. Um, it was like the only place I could go to like seemingly be a music producer, it seemed. So it was awesome. I mean, not even like just business. It's like I just wanted to do that with my life, you know? I just wanted to like produce records. And I couldn't really do that where I was. So it kind of seemed like it just was possible there, you know? And nowhere else on earth. If you want to be doing anything like in the studio with people, LA is a thousand percent the spot to move to. Like everybody goes there to do sessions and everything. I think that one thing that fans and critics maybe really celebrated about A Thousand Gex was that it was really embraced its extremes. Did you feel a sort of, I mean, we talked a little bit about the pressure, but was there a pressure to, to be fucking weird this time around? Was there, did, did you feel that initial pressure to, because when we, when we sort of alluded to like remaking the last album and, and maybe that being one of the things to scrap, this album doesn't sound like you've put the internet through a blender again. It sounds like you've avoided, like there are extremes on the album. It, it does sound like there's, but it but it's not the same sorts of extremes was that part of the pressure was it was it sort of like even down to like the augmentation of your voice laura like resisting some of that i think it's a mix of things like we try not to be too like influenced by like what people are expecting or whatever i feel like having expectations drive anything in the music making process is not super chill but like i don't know dylan what do you speak on that um, I just think we wanted to like do different shit more so than like feeling the pressure to do that, you know? We just wanted to make a different kind of record. Yeah. We were listening to different shit too. I wasn't listening to like all the same like nightcore and shit that I was listening to when we were making the first one. I was listening to other shit. <laughs> well, a lot of those touchstones, those genres that you're talking about, whether it's like new metal or a sort of third wave ska or pop punk. I mean, maybe it's just because to a more mainstream listener, maybe maybe they're just more recognizable touchstones. But one thing that's noticeable to me is that they're they're really um they're quite faithfully reproduced. There's, it definitely sounds like a hundred gex, but it seems like the, there's quite a lot of um energy and work and like meticulousness put into quite a faithful reproduction of some of these things. I was curious about that, like about how much energy is put into that and how important it is, or maybe how satisfying it is to recreate some of those sounds, especially sounds that maybe in 2023 seem a little bit unloved. We love, I mean, we love all the things that we put into it. We love new metal and we love ska and we love, you know, all of these different things that people always, you know, cite about it. So like, yeah, of course we want to make it sound good. We, we put a lot of love into, into making each of the things, you know, not half-assing any of it. That's our whole thing. <laughs> We we don't we don't half ass it. I'm not just saying. Obviously, you make them 
good. I'm not questioning that you're like trying to make them as good as possible. That's always been your goal, right? Like whether whatever style, whatever you're doing. But, but you mean you mean make them make them faithful? Yeah, to... I think they're faithful in a way that like, especially when people are dabbling in in these sorts of genres to the extent that anybody is dabbling in these sorts of genres. I think that people might be maybe I don't know if afraid is the right word. But it's quite rare to find somebody going back and I mean, we interviewed Mike Shinoda on this podcast a few weeks ago. When people are like tipping their cap to Lincoln Park now, it's not done with that degree of sort of like, there are sounds here that even like specific things that sound like sort of record scratches here that sound like very faithfully reproduced. They're record scratches. They're record scratches. <laughs> No, no, I, I I know what you're saying. I get what you're saying. Like, yeah, the whole like pop act does a pop punk inspired thing is like definitely a thing. Like people have done that a hundred times at this point. And it's like, I don't like when they do it. <laughs> I like when we do it. I don't like, I don't like when they do it though. Um, I don't know. I mean, well, one is that we, I mean, we listen to a ton of shit and we listen to, we listen to a bunch of shit that we like and also a bunch of shit that we don't like. And we pick apart like what we don't like about it and stuff. So try to make it sound more like the things that we like than things that we don't like. So just by, by trial of fire, the sounds that, uh, that sound more like shit we like ends up surviving. We bought the guitars. We bought... <laughs> Dylan has Dylan has an eight string and we ran it into with a HM2 into a fucking uh dual rec and mic'd the dual rec four by twelve cab. It if it sounds faithful, it's because yeah, it's it sounds good. It just is that. Like it it sounds like itself, you know. Scratching records, it's not just like record scratching sounds. We we got our friend to come in and lay down some fucking scratches on a bunch of the shit. We got, um, you know, real drums fucking playing on it. We got Josh Freeze, yeah. Same room as Toxicity. Same room as Toxicity, kind of. Same building. No, same, same room. room. Same room, yeah, okay. Yeah, same, same room. Studio 2 East West. In the interview with The Times, you guys had a few months ago, Dylan, one, one thing that you said was, you've been told for a long time that Scar is shit. Like you've hurt, you've just absorbed that from people for a long time. Yeah, very hated genre. Is it is taking things that are unloved and sneered at a little bit, and and openly loving them a little a little bit rebellious? I guess it could be, but it's not like that's not like the reason we're like doing it. We just do it because we like it. There's shit we steal from that people don't hate too. I think, but <laughs> <laughs> we do what we like, and if that's something that people hate, it is what it is. Dubstep, fucking new metal, ska. People are thumbing their nose at that or whatever, or whatever, doing whatever. You said thumbing your nose and now that's stuck in my head. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, we know what we're doing is what I keep saying in the in all the fucking interviews. Like, it's nuanced. Like, we're not ignorant to the facts of of life. We are not trying to do it just to do it. We're not like, <laughs> we should do a new metal song because people hate new metal. That would be really funny. <laughs> like it's like we were listening to new metal and we were like, God damn, that shit smacks. This shit's fire. That shit's fire. Yeah. And you know, and then yeah, there's things that we think are kind of funny in it. Like they're but like bands that do new metal only probably think that some of the shit in it is kind of funny. Like I'm sure Fred Durst fucking thinks that's a lot. <laughs> Some of that shit is fucking hilarious to fucking, you know, like a super heavy drop is kind of funny. Like it just is like, it's great, but like, it doesn't make it not good either. It just is like, you're like, <laughs> years ago, I interviewed, um, you remember the band, the darkness, the British rock band. They're the ones that are like, uh, I believe in a thing called love. Yeah. I, I just heard that at a bar the other day. We were we were all for the first time. No, dude. <laughs> okay. I I recently I heard like, I recently heard that song again for the millionth time at a bar, <laughs> um, and we were all like everybody I was with was all like screaming out the lyrics of that giant hook. Doesn't mean it's not funny. Doesn't mean it doesn't go. Well, that's the thing. And but they were very aware of that. Like I I spoke to I spoke to the lead singer about that a while back, and and. 
he remembers being really pissed off. They almost got in a physical fight with the Strokes on tour because they fucking hated the Strokes because, but partly because critics would look at what the Darkness were doing. He would like absolutely rip an incredible guitar solo that he was really proud on and worked really hard on. And they would be like, ah, that's a funny joke. And he was like, no, I worked really hard on this. Like, yes, the last, the last lyric was a joke about my dick, fine. But this is like, I've spent weeks working on this guitar solo and then everybody would look at the strokes and be like, oh, isn't it just incredible what they're doing with it? It's like, no, I'm, I'm taking this seriously. It's just, I, I can also, like things that are funny can, can also have things that are like worthy of respect within them as well. It's like, those aren't exclusive. It's playfulness. We're not making a joke or anything, but it, yeah, like I'm sure the, the darkness doesn't think that they're like, funny like they're not like telling a bunch of fucking jokes on stage they're not the lonely island or something it's like you know they're like trying to make a good song and they embrace that there are funny elements of that and like they're not taking it too seriously and that's what look at fucking i mean uh, to go back to it look at limp biscuit look at their fucking last album you know nobody's thinking they're just joking but at the same time their album is literally called like still sucks and he's got a song about how he looks like a dad now or something, you know, like it's, 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 it's a mixture. It's, it's nuanced. It's not, it doesn't have to be any one thing, you know, we can take ourselves seriously and not take ourselves seriously all the time. It's very interesting that there's so much confusion about that. I'm like, is that how you live your life? I take myself seriously, but I don't take myself seriously on a moment to moment basis. You don't tell one joke and then it's like, that's actually who I am now and I totally don't take myself seriously and I don't pay my bills anymore or whatever. It's, it's, a, it's a mixture. It's a, yeah, nuanced. Does it surprise you then when that's the response? It's like surprising that it's brought up all the time. I'm like, don't we get this? I think people get it, but they don't get it, get it. Or they don't know that it, it's what we're doing. I wonder if part of it's because, I don't know, may, maybe this is a little bit overblown, but I think a lot of music now isn't fun and that doesn't necessarily mean that you, what you're doing shouldn't be taken seriously it's just like there isn't music that so openly embraces fun in the same way that gags are so maybe that sort of you know, shocks people or catches people off guard we don't know what to make of it i like shit that's not fun i loved the fucking that mounty re record that shit was incredible oh yeah that made me quit smoking cigs <laughs> really i thought you quit smoking cigs before the crow one yeah the, the crow, crow one me, yeah yeah, I listened to that and then I quit smoking cigs the next day. Nice. Wow. Yeah. Hell of sad. A, a lot of, it just, it's uh, different strokes. Different strokes for different folks. folks. There's a community around your music that responds to that as well. You guys have been pretty clear about the fact that you want to create an environment and a community and a fan base that, yeah, I mean, can have fun. And also it's like an, a very accepting and welcoming environment. Did you have that when, when you were younger? Did you feel that in music scenes in Missouri? There's almost no music scene I feel like that I was in in St. Louis. Yeah, I, I was just doing things in my bedroom, pretty much. Yeah, just like a close-knit group of friends. Like, mm -hmm. Were there music scenes that you read about or, or saw or like heard about that you aspired to? Yeah, totally. I was on, on the internet being like, God damn, I got to move to Chicago. Chicago. That would, be really, that would be really cool. Or like, I got to move X place or whatever. Because that's cool. There's lots of cool music coming out of that place. I was like, wow, footwork is so cool. As well as fans, there's like a community of musicians that you have somewhat accidentally been installed as like the figureheads or a shorthand for a music scene, for a genre, and for a genre of music that's sort of barged its way into the mainstream. Which is weird. I mean, when you when you were both saying that, yeah, it's been it's been a couple of years since your last album came out and things have changed. One of the things that's changed is you released a record and now, like, my mom knows who you are. <laughs> so <laughs> crazy. Does that does that feel strange? It's a crazy feeling. Is there a discomfort with that at all? Well, I mean, depends. It's super dope that people have been inspired by the stuff that we've done and like that there's like more of a acceptance for stuff that sounds similar, even if it's not inspired by us, you know? So that's great. Like, love that. What do you want your influence to be? Because if things sort of get out of the person's control, as you say, like after things are published, they're, they're published and they're done. 
I, I think from speaking to people who are influenced by your music, like speaking to other like younger musicians who are involved in the scene, one thing that they might take from your music is like a sort of sense of liberation. Like they can play anything they want. They can sound like anything they want. Like whether that's pitching, like just like fucking with their voice or just like pulling from any genre. That's ideal. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's totally the the ideal. Uh, if people say that, then I am super duper happy. The, the, the feeling that you can, you can make any kind of music you want. Well, that's how I felt like fucking... When I was in high school, like, or I, I don't know, like early high school or something, I saw like the Mars Volta and I was like, I didn't see them, but I like learned of them and watched a ton of fucking online videos and stuff. And I was like, that sounds super wacky. Like, I didn't know. I mean, I didn't know too, super much music and shit, but I was like, wow, that's super like crazy. That's crazy that they can just do that. Like they can just like do that and they don't have to like have like, jobs they hate and they can just do that like all the time and they can whatever it's, i thought the same thing about uh machine girl too i was like wow like they just do that that's all they do they just do that and fucking they're it's good it's fine they're doing fine it's super cool to hear that about that people say that about us because like it's true just make something that you like that you think is cool and like people will somebody will you know what i mean like people will think it's it's cool you can turn that into a the thing you do for your whole life that was laura les and dylan brady in conversation with the fader 100 gex is new album 10,000 gex is out this friday march 17 via dog show and atlantic records the fader interview is engineered by tony d'ambroni the executive producer is Alex Robert Ross, and the associate producer is Raphael Helfand. We'd like to thank Loughton Audio for providing our microphones. You can find them online at lautenaudio.com. And we'd like to thank James Ivey for providing our intro music. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd appreciate if you left a five-star rating and review. And do keep an eye on thefader.com for essential music news, interviews, and essays. We'll be back soon with another episode of the Fader interview. Goodbye until then. You know that one song you can't get enough of? Chances are it was made with a sample from Splice. Explore top packs made by your favorite producers, sketch out song ideas in seconds with Create Mode, and dive into a sample catalog that's so deep, it's dangerous. Find out why Splice is the industry's not-so-secret secret. Visit splice.com and try for free today.